record. Okay. So I should be live and in action here. And this is where I screwed up last time. When you put this thing in presentation mode, you can't stay here. If y'all are doing this and trying to record, you have to go up here and duplicate. There you go. Because last time, when I would change a slide up here, it wouldn't change here. And then it got to the point I couldn't change it here. And I don't know, it was all, all pretty strange. So anyway, uh, I, think, I think this is all working. I'll find out at the end of class when I try to, try to look at this. But anyway, so this is, this is something like slide 11 or 12 of this uh, presentation we started out last time. And it's kind of in the middle, but I wanna go a little bit slow here. Um, because I did have one or two comments after class that generally students don't know that this cycle is out there. There's not time in thermo to do all this stuff. And really the thermo where you would cover this is chemical engineering thermo. We get a phase diagram here later that, you know, when I was, what, a senior, my undergraduate degree, I took a, a thermo elective class that had a good bit of chemical engineering thermo in there and haven't looked at it for about 40 years. <laughs> when I get that phase diagram, we're going to skip over that. <laughs> but anyway, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that today. So, you know, we'll just go back through a number of these slides and take, and take it easy. Um, again, dilute Dilute, the way I think about it is th this, this concentration, this percent is the lithium bromide percent. And so the low percent lithium bromide is this 50% or 58%, which means it's got as much water as it can hold. So that's why it's dilute. The salt is diluted by the water. That's how we're thinking about this. And then up here, when we come out of this generator, we'll see that you know, so this stuff gets pumped up here, we heat it up and the water boils off. And so we're coming out of here at about 65%, we'll see. Um, so, and then an intermediate solution is gonna get sprayed up here. And then this stuff will suck all this water vapor up that we're evaporating in the evaporator. And so then the water's back in the lithium bromide and it's dilute and we got a cycle here. So a, a lot of this extra stuff you hadn't seen before takes the, pre, the place of the compressor, okay? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get off of electrical energy into thermal energy. And that's, that's the input up here. It's some form of thermal energy, which basically heats this stuff up to boil the water off. So that's kind of uh, the name of the game. Uh, and here, as I do, I always jump ahead, but so we're, we're showing, you know, when we can get as much water as we can get in there, it's 58%. We come up here, we heat it up, all the water goes, the water vapor goes this way through the cycle and the lithium bromide, and there's still 35% by mass is water, but that's as much as we can get out practically up here. I mean, if you heat it, the, the more you heat it, the more you'll get out, but you, get, you start getting to temperatures that are not practical. Okay, uh, and so we're 65% and it's coming back out of here. Uh, we noted last time that um, R718 is uh, water. <laughs> and okay, so I just make a note, maximum allowable strong solution at full load is about 65%. So there we go. Um, so where the, the strong solutions, not much water comes back, you know, we put the heat exchanger in because this stuff's coming out hot and it's going back in the chiller. We'd like to cool it down. This stuff's coming out at I think 103 we see goes up here. We want to heat it up. So by preheating this stuff in this heat exchanger, we reduce the amount of thermal energy that we have to put in up there. So it's just a handy way to transfer some energy from this stream to this stream. So they just put a heat exchanger in. And we'll see, I can't remember all the temperatures, we'll see them up there in a minute, but it comes down here and we have multiple pumps in this thing, but they're small, that is electrical load, but they're very small compared to the number on a centrifugal chiller. Um, 
good point of digression. Um, what, how, much, how much electrical load is a centrifugal chiller? You know, we talk about, we base everything kind of oftentimes on a ton of cooling. Okay, and I didn't write this stuff up there last time because I was intimidated because of my Zoom and all of this. So I'm, I'm back into the swing of things over here. But, okay, so one ton of cooling equals 12,000 BTUs per hour, okay? Any idea where that comes from? That comes from back in the days when the ice truck used to run. Back in my grandmother's grandmother's, or my grandmother's mother's, you know, what's that? My great grandmother used to live. They, you know, they had an ice box and they actually had the ice truck ran and they bought a block of ice every day and set it in the bottom of the ice box and it melted. And that was the refrigeration they had to keep the milk cool from spoiling. You know, the ice truck ran. So, well, if you look, you know, let's say we, t we start out with one ton of ice. Well, that's obviously 2,000 pounds, right? Well, so what's the, how much energy does it take to melt a pound of ice? Anybody know? 144. The heat of fusion or the heat of melting. If you have ice, if you have saturated water right at the point of freezing, it's 144 BTUs a pound to freeze it, or if you melt it, it sucks up 144 BTUs a pound, okay? So if we take 2,000 pounds mass times 144 BTUs per pound mass, and divide that by how often did the ice truck run? Every 24 hours. Guess what? This comes out to 12,000 BTUs per hour. One ton of cooling. That's a pretty cool unit, you know? Some of these units, I don't know, but uh, I mean, it, it is interesting to go back into history and see where some of these units came from, but that's why it's a ton of cooling. Now, that's a rate, right? This is a rate. Okay, we can talk about an amount, if we wanna talk about, in terms of tons, if we wanna talk about an amount of cooling, We talk about one ton hour, okay? So that would be, that would be 12,000 BTUs per hour times one hour would give one ton hour and that's 12,000 BTUs as an amount, okay? It's easy to get confused and sometimes in the literature, you know, articles and stuff like that, they'll just talk about a ton of cooling as an amount and they write the unit wrong. In fact, there's even train stuff. I've had to correct this. I've got a second presentation I wanna hand it out today when I first got this from, I don't know where I got them. I was doing this a long time and people send you stuff. You see stuff and hey, would you give me that? I'd like to use that. They send it to you. And so this next presentation had this mistake all through it. And you know, it's like people, they understand, but they just get fast and loose with the units. And so, but it'll confuse you. You know, if you're trying to work through something and the unit's not quite right, you know, if you can't, if you're doing a calculation and you can't make the units right, don't give it to anybody else until you get those units right. Because you remember the Hubble telescope? That remember that went up and all? When they first put the Hubble telescope up, I was like, I don't know, $300, $500 million project. The Hubble telescope was blind. It couldn't see anything. It couldn't focus, you know, and they cut these mirrors and all this stuff and you know, all this expense. And you know what it was? It was a conversion error. They went back and dig, dug back and back and back. Somebody, in the, and I don't know exactly what it, what it did, 
but they sent up a spacecraft. I think they had to recut the mirrors. And they, they sent that, we had a spacewalk back in the day and they sent a crew of astronauts up and they got into that thing and they fixed it. That's a pretty expensive repair call. You know, I know when, you're, when your dishwasher breaks, it might be 150, 200 bucks, but you know, what's that? A hundred million bucks to go fix the damn Hubble telescope because some stupid engineer at NASA couldn't do units right. Ooh, ooh. So anyway, so one ton hour is one ton times one hour equals 12,000 BTUs. End of story. And so, you know, well, if you have a 500 ton chiller that's operating for 200 hours, how many ton hours of refrigeration is that? Well, how many tons is it? It's 500 tons, but you got to multiply it times the number of hours. Okay. So simple stuff, but man, the devil's in the details. Engineers got to be detailed people. You know, it's one thing, and I, I'm bad about this. I like to just see the big concepts and go, well, yeah, I could calculate that if I wanted to, but I'm too lazy. I don't want to. I'll, I'll do that later, you know, and you, you got to get down into the, the details with it. Okay. So, oh, I started out on the centrifugal, didn't I? Yeah, that's right. That, this was a digression on the digression. So a centrifugal chiller, how much power do they use? What's a, what, what's a number? It's kind of like that. That's the way efficiencies are given on chillers these days or KW per ton. Okay. So for an electric, say for a, a, an electric centrifugal, Chiller. You know, this next presentation, I, 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 a, a number today, and these things keep getting better. When I was your age, the number was one kW per ton. Now the number is between 0.4 and 0.6 kW per ton. So this next presentation we'll get to after the, this uses 0.6, pretty standard number. Presentation been out there a little while. I don't know. You, you, you know, they're constantly making them more efficient. You know, the, the the trains and carriers and you know the Japanese guys all around the world continue to get better at making these things. That's for sure. So I would say right now, you know, just for a swagging number, we can use 0.6 kW per ton. Well, I, I mean, these are good numbers to know. Because if you walk out there in the field and you come up across a, a just for ease of arithmetic, a, a thousand ton chiller. So a thousand ton chiller is going to be roughly a 600 kW load, right? So that's why it's nice to have some of these numbers parked away in your head. So you've got some kind of an idea. You can, you can do stuff quickly or, you know, just rip, whip out your calculator and run some numbers. So 1,000 ton electric. Centrifugal chiller is on the order of a 600 kW load. Okay. All right. Does that include like pumps associated with the No, no, that's just the chiller itself. If you figure the whole plant, the whole plant's probably still going to be up, uh, you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 kW per ton. And, and that's right. And you know, if you're gonna compare refrigeration systems, you gotta, you gotta compare the whole ball of wax. Absolutely, yeah. But I mean, like at the tech plant down there, like I said, we've got four big chillers, I think. Uh, they just put one in, it might be a little smaller. It might be an 800, something like that. Uh, is a new one 12? Okay, well, that's right. You're working down there. You know that. Well, here, keep me straight here, Avery. Um, Avery works at Fiscal Plant down there, and he works on the computer that controls a lot of stuff around campus. He's the, uh, uh, yeah, that's a wonderful experience. That's a great job to have. Um, well, they got, 
what, 15, two 1500s and another 1200? I think that's right. So there's two 1500s and two 1200 ton chillers. Now, they don't have to run all of those at the same time. Uh, that's new ones put in because of the, the, the construction between the new fitness center and this building. You know, this science building, I think, is going to be the biggest building in Putnam County. It's like, whoa. I mean, Almost a quarter of the entire square footage of the whole campus. How many square feet is that? Do you, do you remember? Uh, 165,000. Golly. I, I mean, for, for Tennessee Tech, that's a big building for Putnam County. When I worked at uh, University of Tennessee Medical School in a fiscal plan operation before I went back and got my PhD, we had the general education building over there was 300,000 square feet. Of course, that's in the middle of downtown Memphis, right? That's all in there with Baptist Hospital. When you look at Baptist Hospital, this thing looks small. I mean, Baptist Hospital is probably, I don't know, 12, 15 story building. That's, I mean, millions of square feet. And, you know, so uh, the GEB, was 300,000, eh, you know, it's pretty good size. But you come to Cookville, you start thinking about GEB, good Lord, that's what the square footage of Tennessee Tech or something, you know. I mean, it's huge. So it's all, I guess it's all relative to what you're looking at. Okay, so anyway, I want to give you a little, as we go through this, I'm going to try to give you some little snippets. And some of these things I write up here would really be good. I mean, you can't memorize everything, but it'd be good some of these round numbers to kind of stick up there in the head and try to, so there's a few conversion factors you really ought to know off the top of your head. Okay, so, you know, what are we? We're 65% here, we're 58% there. This stuff comes down and this cooled down strong solution mixes, gets injected at the suction of this pump. And so this pump's gonna mix that stuff up pretty good. You know, when you go through a, uh, a pump impeller, or you don't have to worry about getting it mixed over here. That, that's a good place to put it in. And so, you know, so we're 62% here. So that's still, it has the ability to absorb some water vapor, which is generated up here. And it keeps sucking up that water vapor, which keeps the pressure low down here. And then when it, it when this stuff is saturated, it, it, uh, it just lays down here. That's got a sump that kind of collects it. Uh, down at the bottom. Um, no, nah, I think we've talked through all that. Um, and of course, the other thing to keep in mind is that this is uh, exothermic. So actually it's in the absorber uh, down here. When this stuff is getting absorbed, it's given off heat. And that's why we have to, when we get the whole cycle up here, you know, that's what this cooling water comes in for is to suck up there. This thing would just overheat if you didn't keep it cooled down because it's given off heat there. And then of course, we got to have cooling up here to condense the water vapor that's coming across from the generator. You know, I don't know why, I, I just I, I kind of like this cycle. I've heard from people that have them, especially older machines, they were a pain in the butt for some reasons we'll get to, to operate, but I mean, just thinking your way through it, it's pretty interesting to me uh, how you can accomplish the refrigeration uh, with a basically a chemically based cycle. Um, got some temperatures. We added one, we're 103 down here. Uh, cooling water, 85 in, 95 out here. Okay, now what we're gonna see is, we're gonna see that the cooling tower load is larger for the same cooling load, we have more, we're gonna to have to have larger cooling tower for this. Okay, so talk a little bit about cooling towers, um, just to kind of throw this out, because we're gonna we're gonna have a module in the course which is on cooling towers. But anyway, uh, for the centrifugal, the standard for years and years, the old design criteria was for, for Tennessee, for this region of the country was 95 water in, 85 water out at a 78 wet bulb. Okay, so cooling towers are sized based on a maximum wet bulb temperature because a cooling tower is an evaporation device and it's the wet bulb temperature that tells you, you know, how much uh, evaporation potential you have with that air coming in. 
So that higher the wet bulb for a given cooling load, the higher the wet bulb, the bigger the tower's got to be because you know you're putting more moisture in with the air. You, the assumption is the, the air is going to leave the top of the tower at saturation. So the drier it is coming in, the better, the more effective the tower is. Okay. So for a given heat load, if you're in a, a moisture climate like in South Florida someplace you're going to have a higher wet bulb in, which means you've got to have a bigger tower to dissipate it. If you're in Arizona, oh man, that tower is going to work like a son of a gun because you can, it's so dry, that air coming in is probably going to have a 60 degree wet bulb instead of a 78 degree wet bulb. So those are your design parameters. Water temperature in, water temperature out, and the ambient wet bulb that you want to size your tower based on. And that comes from long-term weather data. So, you know, the industry will have standard numbers, but when you look at a tower, you'll see, you know, evaporative cooling tower, 95 slash 85 slash 78. And this will be a question on your test. I'll give you some numbers and say, okay, what are those numbers? I'm not going to, I won't even tell you their temperatures. That's for you to know. But the first number is the water temperature into the top of the tower. The second number is the leaving water temperature from the tower that's coming back to the chiller. And the third number is the design ambient wet bulb temperature of the air that's coming into the tower. So after all that tirade, if you look at the slide down here in the absorber, we got 85 in. Hey man, I feel comfortable. I know where that number comes from. We got 95 out here, but whoa, the number they put up here, it's not on this slide, is 103. So all of a sudden I'm going 85 to 103. Well, my centrifugal chiller would be going 85 to 95. So what is that? Eight more degrees of heat that's going to that cooling tower. For the same ambient wet bulb, that cooling tower has got to be like 80% bigger. Ah, there's additional expense. And we're gonna see that. Um, Y'all have the carrier program. I'm gonna email you out some models that you can load. We'll, you know, in, in the other class, we make, we spend a good bit of time on building those models. So I'm gonna, I gotta kind of short circuit that a little bit. And so, because I can't teach the same course twice, you know. But anyway, I'll get you up to speed on building them, but we're gonna do that kind of piecemeal. I'm gonna send you a model and I'll show you how to load it and then show you how to run simulations. And we can run different chillers and, you know, cooling towers and all that sort of thing and see what the annual cost differential is and when it saves money and when it doesn't save money. Now that, I mean, our whole point of this is to try to find a way that we can do it cheaper, you know. Because at the bottom, at, you know, we're all engineers and like to chase energy and stress and all that. But at the end of the day, the guy that hires you, the client is interested. It always comes back to money, you know. And so we like to try to chain some of these concepts back to money. Okay. All right. I think that's pretty good. Uh, we've been through all. I think we're pretty well through this. Ah, uh, okay. Now I changed. Say I'm I'm constantly editing on this slide. There were some different words in here that got printed, and I went back and looked at that today, and I didn't really like it. So what they're saying is that this heat exchanger is 70% efficient, and the words aren't very good on your slide. Uh, so however much energy is flowing into this thing we get a 70% transfer over to this cold stream that's going back up to the generator. If you did M dot CP delta T across these things, you would see that uh, the energy exchange is only 70% uh, of what is, of what you could get if you had a perfect, an infinitely large heat exchanger. So, so we're saying we're showing 214 out of the generator we're showing 135 out of the heat exchanger. I believe that's 130. Yeah, it's hard to tell what they what they mean that 135 to be. I suspect that's probably it. We're going 103 up here to 175. So 
outside and you get some idea of what the temperature is like. They, these are Fahrenheit. Okay, so a picture, picture of the heat exchanger. Yeah, here's, here's where they show the, the concentrated solution in at 214, out at 135, dilute solution in at 103, out at 175. Um, another thing this does, th this does reduce the load on the cooling tower a little bit because, you know, the cooler we can make this, you can see this, this 135 is coming in here mixing with 103. So the cooler we can make this, the less we're going to have to, cooling we're going to have to do right here. So it has an impact on the cooling tower. And obviously, you know, the hotter we can get this coming in, the less heat we're gonna have to put in to get to the same temperature up there. So that's pretty obvious. Uh, yeah, okay. So I don't think there's anything there. 65% leaving here and 214. Strong solution. So this is a gravity flow on this side. So we talked about that. So that's it. Okay. So at some point, somebody may ask you some very detailed questions about how this cycle operates. So does, do you have questions? Do you understand pretty much? Can you work your way around this cycle? At least in terms of an explanation to somebody. As I used to say in the old days, had a teacher did this. Thing. If you can't explain it to your grandmother, you don't understand it. <laughs> if you have to hide behind big, big engineering terms and can't explain it so that granny understands it, then you don't really understand it and you're just hiding behind terms. So think about, it. you know, see if you could explain this to your girlfriend. Now, if you do too much, she'll probably break up with you because you'll say you're just too much of a geek engineer for her, but you know. That would be a that would be a challenge. Explain this to your girlfriend. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, this is this phase diagram. I, I ain't doing it. Okay. Um, crystallization. Well, this is one of the banes of absorption. So when you get this concentrated salt, you know, water salt solution, if you drop the temperature too much, the salt will crystallize. It'll come out of solution and then it blocks up everything. And the first, the first absorber I ever saw was probably, oh, what year was that? Oh man, it was on the Naval Air Station Millington. I worked for a, uh, what was it, about 70, what did I go, 70, 78, 79. When I first got my bachelor's degree, I went to work for a consulting company, Energy Solutions Incorporated. ESI, and it was formed by my favorite professor at, this was at, uh, was Memphis State in those days, or Tiger High, as we used to call it. Um, and he and a couple of his buddies formed a consulting firm. He actually left the university for a couple of years, and I worked for him. And uh, so they got a TVA contract to do energy assessments, energy evaluations for big buildings. And at that time, Naval Air Station Millington was the largest inland naval base in the world. That was huge. Now it got shut down back. They had a bunch of base closures in the 80s or 90s, something like that. And Millington got shut down. But I mean, it was huge. It was like a city out there. And so we were doing energy work. I went in this one building and, you know, big, big building, you know, chill water plant and all that sort of thing. And they had one of these absorbers. And down there on one of the heat exchangers, it was beat to hell. I mean, you could see, you know, there's no insulation on it. I mean, the damn thing was dented and tore up and all this. And I, I said, what's this all about? I mean, I didn't hardly know what an absorber was back in those days. And uh, they said, well, that's for some children. I said, well, what's all this? Crap? They said, oh, I think crystallizes all the time. And, you know, we got to break that salt up in there. So we take a sledgehammer over here and we just pound the side of that song again until we break it up enough that we can get the flow moving again. I went, Sound like a real good idea, but what the hell? What do I know about it? I don't know. So anyway, that was the first absorber I ever saw. But so there's different things that can cause temperatures to go a little bit high in the machine, and if it or a little bit low, I'm sorry, 
And um, if uh, if you say if, if this con if that strong solution falls below this minimum temperature salt leaves solution and we have a problem. So what can cause this? One thing that can happen is air can leak. I mean, remember the low pressures. The high pressure was like, like 0.135 psi a, and atmospheric pressure is 14.7. So I mean, this is this is 11, 12 psi vacuum and that's on the high side on the low side it's what 10 times less than that so you know seals and all that sort of thing are critical to keep the air out so if the evaporator pressure goes up if we have leaks then what happens is that 40 degree temperature count rises and that 40 degree temperature rises to 42 43 44 where you can't get capacity out of the machine and so you can't do the cooling you need to do. And so the controls tell this thing, you got to fire harder. We got to put more heat in there to get more capacity out of the machine. And it just, it, 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 so that drives up the concentration. And when you come out of the heat exchanger, you cool it down, bingo, you get crystallization. So yeah, so that's one thing, air can leak. Uh, oh, and, I think one time I stuck all the, every, every time there was one of these pages, I stuck one of these pages. I'm not sure if that was a good idea. So you could look at the cycle again, but anyway, I did. Um, low condenser water temperature. So say at low condenser water temperature, if it's too low, we're gonna make this solution too cold, and then the heat exchanger is gonna pull this down too low, and bingo, crystallization. So we gotta have, we can't, dry, we can't let this go, like in the winter time, we can't let that go too low, crystallize. Uh, electric power failures used to cause, uh, some of the, these things are a lot better these days, but these are kind of traditionally uh, some of the wraps on the absorbers. Uh, there's a normal shutdown that allows for dilution of the cycle. So that strong solution, you know, they would have, uh, on shutdown, they would dilute that a little bit. So you're so when it cools down, it wouldn't crystallize. But if you have a power failure, you lose that capability could lead to crystallization. So solution, they, this has gotten much better. We got automatic purge. It can, can sense when the air is in the machine and they go ahead and suck it out and get rid of it automatically as part of the cycle. Uh, shutdown protection, they can design the machine so that on a power failure that they're less likely to have that open and of course controls exploding much, much better. Uh, okay, so this lithium bromide, and it should say this, I'm gonna modify this slide, I was thinking about it, but I ran out of time. This has to do with corrosion, because salts are corrosive. So lithium bromide is very corrosive. So in order to avoid corrosion problem, we put inhibitors in. Well, of course, then the inhibitors can cause problems. So you have to worry about having your, your, your uh, chemicals right in order to prevent corrosion in the machine. And I'm, you know, I would not ask you a specific point. I would ask you maybe something to indicate if you realize we have to do some kind of corrosion protection on the chiller because of the salts. You know, I'm not gonna get down into some of this stuff. I don't consider myself much of a corrosion expert or a water treatment expert. You know, I have a great appreciation for those things. Okay, so this mach the machine we've been looking at, all this wonderful stuff, this is a single stage machine. Okay, it's not terribly efficient. They make double stage, they make triple stage machine. I don't know if you can buy a triple stage machine. We had a faculty member here for a little while who I think he was out of the University of Tennessee as PhD, but he did his, his research at Oak Ridge and they were working on like triple effect and quadruple effect absorption machines. That was his uh, research. Well, I tell you, single effect, okay, I can pretty well handle this. When you start getting into double and triple effect, the diagrams just gets, gets complicated. They got crap everywhere, you know? I think the concepts are not so hard, but when you look at the diagrams, you kind of go, Oh my God, what's going on in this thing? So, 
and we'll get uh, this. So that's, that's a two stage horizon is trains name. So what happens is we have, a, we have two generators. That's what the double stage is. So we're, we're generating, we got a higher temperature and then we've got a lower temperature generation process. So with a triple effect, there would be three generators. So you're able to pull more refrigerant out so you're better to overall put less heat in. And you just get better efficiency. I'm not gonna ask you to trace your way through that. I mean, I think, you know, I just want you to understand basically what, I want you to understand what that does. If you understand that, given enough time, dedication, and energy, you could work your way through the two stage. So, but I'm not that. Uh, there's some general slides here talking about, you know, Carnot stuff. I don't know. I think I'm gonna let you all read those. This is talking about, there's the same amount of energy in these two beakers. The idea is if we go up in temperature, then we don't need to move as much fluid around. And the, the two-stage machine operates at much higher temperature. Two-stage machine, I think the minimum is about 350 Fahrenheit. 350, 400, they, they probably want four, 450. Well, that starts getting pretty high and that limits the number of applications. Now, if you're, wh where it does open the door is if you're actually combusting, if you have a fuel you can combust, like if you're burning natural gas or you're burning some sort of a waste gas, landfill gas or something like that, then generating 450 is not a problem because I mean, you got combustion going on it what, 1800, 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, I mean, you can get some temperature. You just gotta get everything sized right. But if you're trying to do waste heat recovery at a plant, you know, there's a whole lot more waste heat available at 200, 250 than there is, you know, to get 400 degrees, you probably have to have at least 500 or 550 degree waste heat temperature and there's not near as many of those applications out there as there are for the lower temperature. So for, you know, if you're combusting or you have a high temperature source, you probably want to look at the two-stage machine for the efficiency gain. Even though the, you know, you're buying more hardware, so the equipment's going to get more expensive. But, you know, you'd have to evaluate. There's probably more bang for the buck in a two-stage machine if you can, if you have that temperature available. But, you know, if you've got free energy, at 250, oh hell, I mean, that's single stage right there because free energy is free, right? You know, it's kind of in the definition and you can't do better than that, you know? So if, you, if all you have to do is buy the equipment, pay the maintenance and run it and the energy input is free, that's probably gonna look pretty good long-term, you know, to see what the, what the payback is. The other thing these things get used for that the other presentation uh, goes into is demand shedding. And, and we'll need to talk more about this. Uh, in electrical billing, there's really two large concepts. There's energy and there's demand. And demand is the highest rate at which you use energy during the billing period. And that's, that's roughly, you know, they can be equivalent charges. It depends on the rate structure. The demand can actually be more than the energy in some cases. You know, it depends on how you use the electricity. Usually I'd say the energy is a little bit more, but it's possible they could be 50% or whatever. So not only it's amount of energy that you use, but it's what your peak looks like during that billing period. And then it gets more complicated that the rate structures are moving into time of day during the peak period of the day, they jack the rates. Well, during the peak period of the day is when the air conditioning load is gonna come because it's the air conditioning load that makes the peak period <laughs> in the summertime. And then of course in the wintertime, it's generally speaking, the, the heating, you know, as far as the overall grid. Now in terms of a big building, a big building is, is gonna need air conditioning, you know, every day of the year for the internal, internal core areas. The skin surfaces, I'm sorry, we'll need, we'll need cooling. The, the big building will need cooling internally all the time. On the skin surfaces in the winter time, if it's cold, you may need some heat. If you got an office like this, classrooms open up that wall. But my office, my office over here doesn't even have heat. 
Languria and I share a, a unit over here. It doesn't have a heating core. Doesn't have it. If I want heat, I got to use my little chill chaser. My office stays cold. I don't have heat. Now this perimeter has heat, but they didn't want to buy a heating coil because I'm internal. I'm all internal to the building. If, if, the, if, the, if all of the space around me is conditioned to 70, 72 degrees, and I'm in my office with my computer on and my lights on and me, how am I, why am I ever going to need heat? Well, the problem is people leave the doors open in the hallway and it gets cold in the hallway. And so the reality of it is, yeah, I could you probably use a little heat, but the design concept is they don't even give me heat. So if I want it, I got to break, I got to pay, you know, well, they got to pay the energy, but I got to pay the equipment cost. Yeah. So, all right. So anyway, some of this is kind of fluff. Uh, this is the direct fire. So see this, this is assuming, uh, this is a steam fire generator. So we got a boiler someplace, like Tennessee Tech could do this. You know, we got a boiler on campus. Now our steam pressure, you know, we would have an issue with this on a, on a two stage because our steam pressure is probably 100, 100 PSI G, which is what, 115 PSI A. How hot is 115 PSI A steam? Well, let me see, that's why I keep this magical. Steam tab companion, saturated steam, pressure, PSIA 115, calculate 238. So if Tennessee Tech wanted to run a two-stage absorber, they would have to raise their steam pressure. Well, would you want to do that? Yeah, probably not because the efficiency ain't great on them. You're, you're burning natural gas. We don't have free fuel over there. We don't have, we're not sitting on top of landfill, thank heavens, you know. Uh, and so they'd be buying fairly expensive natural gas, you know, not terrible, in order to displace electricity, you know, you'd have to run the numbers, but so. Exactly, exactly. So they, so if they, I, I suspect this would not be quite enough for a two stage. So they'd wind up with a single stage absorber that has a COP of about 0.65. And that ain't good. COP on this centrifugal over here is six, seven. Whoa. The absorber, the COP, the single stage, 0 0.65, 0 0.7, something like that. Not very efficient. So that's why. You need to have cheaper free, free thermal energy to make this thing work. The other thing is to avoid the demand peaks. Oh yeah, I got off on that and then forgot where I was. Um, so, you know, if you're on a rate structure that really jacks the demand rates during say eight hours of the day, maybe you can have an absorber and run that absorber during those eight hours of the day and keep your billing demand down, which can generate the savings to perhaps make the project go. So that, that's where the train slides are going. But I go in a lot of companies and I sometimes see applications for absorbers. Because a, a lot of industrial processes need refrigeration as part of the process. You know, they heat stuff up and then they got to cool it down. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. There we go. Uh, I ain't going here. I made that mistake before. All right. Okay, so there's that. Now, this is the direct fired. So this is just like a little boiler unit or something that's on there. We got exhaust gases, you know, that you're, you're generating you know, we got combustion going on here. This is your, uh, what, dilute solution. And we're generating, well, uh, oh, I haven't traced this one out. This may be the strong solution. I'm not sure here. But anyway, this is, uh, we're generating the vapor in here, condensing it, and then we're sending it off to the cycle. And then we got additional generation. 
direct fired. Uh, and this is um, just some idea in the train product line. They've got single stage classic from 100 to 1,660 tons, two stage direct fired Horizon 380 to uh, 750. KTE direct fired, I'm not familiar with that, but apparently it comes in two different size ranges. And then the steam fired from 380 to 1150. So I'll give you some idea what's out there. Okay, into that one. Questions? Hearing none, we will continue. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I was reviewing my notes here. So this is the one I handed out today. Okay. Economics of gas cooling. Okay, so these are kind of the three options that you get. Single stage indirect fire, which means we're gonna supply heat to it, steam, hot water, something hot. Uh, single stage, double stage, or direct effect uh, fired. I'm sorry, double effect direct fired. Um, I don't believe they make a direct fired single effect, as far as I know, I've not seen one. Okay, so some of the, some of the numbers that we'll be looking at. Uh, so this was the size range we saw. Okay, so we can, we put typically hot water in this thing and say it's about 200. They're showing 195 as the minimum to drive the cycle. They would prefer 270, I guarantee you. Hotter, hotter is better. So low pressure steam, they're saying the typical steam supply would be 12 for this guy. Well, you know, that's a thought. Um, 12, so what is that? That's uh, 12, that's 20, 27 roughly PSI. Let's pull up my buddy here. 27, calculate, so 244. 244 on the steam temperature, what they're looking at. Yeah, come on. All right, uh, COP, probably a full, full load value. I think they typically publish in full load, you know, part load could change, 0.67. So what's COP now? Do we, do we remember? What's it stand for? Start there. Dipo, come on, help me, man. Oh, no. Have you heard that term before, COP? Coefficient of performance. Okay, well, we better write this up here. That should have been part of your thermo, but who knows? Useful output energy divided by costly input energy. Okay. It's efficiency. Now, the reason it's given that name is in most chillers, like a centrifugal chiller, that number is six, 6.0. Well, you know, we don't like to call things an efficiency that are over 100%, right? That would be 600%. 
Yeah, engineers, their little rear ends you close up. You know, I don't like that. So I'm going to change the name of it. It's just the efficiency, you know. Now, one of the few devices, say, and it's used for chillers because it's almost always for an electric-driven vapor compression cycle. It's always over one. Well, so we get down here to the COP and it's less than one. So in this one, we could call it the efficiency. But on all the other ones, we can't. <laughs> so it's still the COP. So that's the efficiency. The COP is, a, is another term for efficiency when we expect the value to be over one. Okay. So look at this. Single stage. 18.7 pounds. That's pounds of steam per ton hour of refrigeration. You gotta think about these units a little bit. Okay, so how much is a ton hour of refrigeration? How much energy in terms of BTUs? What do we say, it's 12,000, right? Well, by golly, it's right there, one ton hour. So we're gonna get 12,000 BTUs of refrigeration, but we're gonna to have to use 18.7 pounds of steam. What's our nominal? A pound of steam is worth how many BTUs when we condense it? We had that number last time. So we've got three, three gentlemen from on the other side of the pond here, and they don't like BTUs. <laughs> but don't worry, you guys don't like BTUs either, right? No. no. See, Jared, Jared's honest. You like what? Megajoules? Gigajoules? Do you know how that makes my skin crawl? I just kind of, I hear that mega and I go, oh, I don't like that. Give me a BTU, please. Give me a BTU. And you guys hear BTUs and you go, oh, God, give me a mega jewel or a giga jewel or something. I'm sorry. I'm mean. But the world, the world uses um, all kinds of different units. So you cannot be a slave to the unit. You don't have to like it. Liking it is not required. But being able to function with it is required. I make these international trips. God knows what units they use. What was it? There was a, in China, they used a, a unit I'd never heard of, a ton of coal equivalent. You guys ever heard of that? A TOE for energy. And it's like, it was the equivalent of a typical ton of coal in some, I don't even know what, what units you know, whether it was joules or BTUs or whatever. I mean, I went over there, I don't know, five, six years ago and was working at a couple of industrial flights and they had this unit in it. And when I translate, I got out my Google Translate, you know, I had this <laughs> weird looking symbol that goes, ton of coal equivalent. And I go, wow, that's a new one on me. And I had all these spreadsheets and they had a ton of coal equivalent. So guess what? I had to work in tons of coal equivalent. And so you just get on your conversion utility and, you know, just, and, and you be very careful because you don't want to have a Hubble telescope moment on your report where some guy reads it and go, this guy's a flipping idiot. <laughs> he can't even convert. <laughs> so anyway. Okay. So one ton, I mean, one pound is a thousand BTUs. So that's 18,700 BTUs of input energy in order to get 12,000 BTUs of cooling effect. So let's check that COP. Let's see if that works out. So if I take 12 divided by 18.7, it's 0.64. So it's close, yeah. Not exact, but so, you know, this is, this may be an operational number. I mean, I don't know where that came from, but if you calculate it out here, you would get 0.642 based on this input. Okay. That's 0.24. Oh, you got, you got, you guys going to love this. Everybody's going to love it. Okay. What's a therm? You ever heard of a therm? A therm. Anybody? What's a therm? A therm is 100,000 BTUs, and that's a unit. A therm.
So in the States, natural gas is typically sold per million BTUs. You know, we quote prices $6 a million. So that means $6 per MM BTU. In the States, uh, gas on units of MM BTU. thousand thousand BTUs, MMBTUs. So there are 10 therms equals one million BTUs. <laughs> oh, the world, you know, the concepts are easy, but the, wor the world makes things so hard. It really does. Much harder than it needs to, but that's what we live in. So in order to get this 18.7 pounds of steam, it takes 0.24 therms of natural gas input. Because a therm is 100,000, 0.24 therms is what? 24,000 BTUs. So the efficiency of generating this steam is what? 18.7 divided by 24,000. So the efficiency Generation is equal to eighteen seven zero zero divided by twenty four. Now that's assuming that a pound of steam is a thousand BTUs, and that's a nominal number. Okay, and so let's see what that is. Eighteen point seven divided by twenty four. Now that's seventy seven point nine percent. That's 0.779 or percent. So probably somebody assumed 80 and things have gotten rounded off or something, you know. These are kind of a, approximate and we've only got two digits and all of that. So, this is, so this is the, the 0.24 therms is 24,000 BTUs of gas is required to produce one ton hour of cooling. And that's what this is. Are we having fun? I am, I don't know, I love this stuff. <laughs> I don't think you all are having fun. <laughs> I don't see a lot of happy faces. Don't worry, it'll get worse. It gets way worse than this. Okay, any questions on what they're giving us here? All right. So, yeah, this isn't bad. This is just, this shows a little diagram of the system. So, we got a boiler. We're putting that natural gas in to the boiler. The boiler's making steam. We're putting it down here. We're condensing it. We got some condensate coming back. Hopefully we're not gonna throw it on the ground. Hopefully we're gonna take it back to the boiler. That's, that's the generator, right? And then we got our cooling tower. It's gonna provide the cooling that we need to operate the cycle. So our cooling tower is out here. So we come out of the bottom of the cooling tower, 85, our design spec. We've got, got a little pump on it, pumping down through here. So this is what the absorber, which is, that's where that heat, that's that exothermic reaction is giving off heat. We got to cool it down. So we're 85 in, 95 out. Then we go to the, gen the uh, condenser up here, on the other side, the water vapor comes over. It's 95 to 103. We got 103 going back to the tower. 
water falls down on the tower. We got a fan here sucking air up that has probably a wet bulb temperature design of 78. That causes some of this water to evaporate. That cools down the flow and we fall out at 85 and go keep going around in a circle. This is, this is the air conditioning load on the system. So this is, we've, we've, we, we took our 42 degree chill water or so and we pumped it out all over campus, got sucked up into air handlers, blown through cooling coils, picked up heat in the building, got returned back, came back at typically 10, 12 degree Fahrenheit increase, goes back in uh, the evaporator here, evaporating that water vapor sprayed on the outside of those pipes, 40 degrees inside this chamber, we got 42 degree water, and around and around and around she goes. What do you think? Good stuff? Absolutely. Oh, makeup water, well, it doesn't show it. We would, we would have, we'd have makeup, and we'd have chemical addition, and we'd have makeup water in the boiler, because you're not gonna get all your steam back. So the makeup water would come into the boiler on this side and over here. Uh, this, this loop shouldn't really need much. The chill water, chill water loop ought to be, you know, the assumption is we're not gonna have many leaks of chill water. Something's gotta fail for you to lose chill water. That's a closed loop. And that really helps on, because you don't have to do water treatment much on, on a, uh, a chill water loop. Because, you know, when you fill it, the water has oxygen, but that little bit of, I mean, it's just a one-time deal. That oxygen causes a small amount of corrosion on the inside of the pipes, whatever, but then that's it. Once the oxygen is gone, that little bit of corrosion doesn't cause you a big issue. You just live with that. And that same water circulates around. It ought to stay pretty good. I mean, they, they, they probably put a little bit. We can, we ought to get Andy Loftus. We ought to get Andy come up here and talk to us sometime about this, you know. Anyway. So, but this loop, say this is constantly exposed. This cooling tower is open. It is constantly exposed to the atmosphere. It's constantly picking up uh, oxygen and, and that and potato chip wrappers, and Lord knows whatever else gets into, you know, the, the picks. I say, this is also a very good uh, uh, scrubber. It's, you know, and you got this air, where it, what it does is it scrubs the air through it and all that particulate winds up in the, in the condenser water, this cooling water. And every year they have to close these things down and shovel the mud out of the, the bottom of that trough down there because it builds up over time and falls out. And I mean, it can fall out all over the place. So uh, these cooling tower loops require a lot of maintenance, a lot of chemical treatment and all that sort of thing. But the chill water loop ought to be good. Okay. Uh, just a picture, pretty picture. Okay, two stage. Now we're gonna fly through this boy. Now that, now that I got you, I got you warmed up on all these units. So we just got a size range. Um, high pressure steam, 115, so that's gonna be 130. Okay, I have to do this. I wanna see what they, so this would be 130 PSIA. Okay, uh, 347. About 350 is kind of the number I remember. So, you know, 340, 350, probably enough to drive it. They ought to know they make them. There we go. Okay. COP. Now we're a COP. We're above one. 1 1.2. So that says for, for every unit of costly energy input, I get 1.2 units of refrigeration in whatever unit you want to use because COP is dimensionless. You put the same unit on top and bottom, they cancel, so it's just the ratio. Well, it's not six, but it's better than 0.67, you know? So that's what that extra stage gets you. Okay, so now, we're down to 9.7 pounds of steam input 
per ton hour of refrigeration. Okay, so we got to spend 9.7 pounds of steam to get 12,000 BTUs of cooling. Say these are amounts. Say you got to you got to constantly be careful when you look at these units. You know, and what I always do, I say, okay, is this a rate over a rate, or is this an amount over an amount, or is this a rate over an amount? If it's a rate over an amount, you got to screw up, right? I mean, it might, if it's all per, per, the, per one hour, it, the, the number may work out right, but you've got to screw up in units. You don't divide a rate by an amount, you know, in terms of your, your you know, on, on a unit on a number or something. In an equation, you, you might. Okay, so that's 0.125 therms. Remember, a therm is 100,000 BTUs. So 0 0.125 times 100,000 is 12,500 BTUs of gas. Uh, we can check the, let's check the steam generation, see if that's, so that would be 9,700, 97, oh, I'll just do 100, divided by, uh, 0.776. So they kept the boiler efficiency roughly the same. Okay. Same numbers, same meaning, they just changed a little bit because we got a different device. Everybody good? Okay, so very similar picture. You know, we just, we got this double generator now deal so it changes this picture a little bit. But, you know, we got a boiler, supply and steam, got a cooling tower, we got a cooling load, so it's all. It's all pretty much the same thing. Okay, and there's a nice picture. And you do pick up some hardware, you know, because of that double effect. Okay, direct fired. All right, so I guess again, size range. Now, you can, you can burn lots of different stuff. Uh, natural gas, propane, number two. What's number two? You know what oil that is? What's number two? That's a light oil. Hmm? Light, louder, I can't hear it. Yeah, that's diesel. That's diesel without the additives. Yeah, for, for heating oil purposes. You know, the trucks, they put all that crap in there for, you know, make the engines run better. But yeah, that's basically diesel. So the lower the number, the lighter. Well, I think kerosene's one, isn't it? I think kerosene's one. Number six, number six is like you got to heat it up to pump it, like molasses. And of course, as the number goes up, the price goes down because it's a bigger pain in the rear, rear to deal with. Number six, I mean, lots of boilers. There are some boilers, I don't say lots, but I've been in plants. And so, you know, all of this stuff, it's... Uh, it's kept hot. It's about 185 degrees Fahrenheit. You got to heat it up to, or you can't pump it. You know, if the if the usually I do that with steam. You know, they'll have some steam tracing or steam coils down there in the tank or something like that to heat it up. And uh, if that goes out and that stuff solidifies in the pipe, that's a bad day in the plant. Say you got 200 feet of pipe, and that stuff gets cold. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of, I mean, it doesn't solidify completely, but it's like more, yeah, you turn the pump on and nothing happens because the pump can't pump it. So what do you got to do? You got to go out there somehow and heat up 200 feet of pipe to 200 degrees for an hour. That sounds like a, that sounds like a whole hell of a lot of fun, doesn't it? On a, on a, on a, on a, on a 10 degree day. <laughs> Cause we can't run the boiler because the fuel oil got cold. Interesting, but it's cheap. So the bean counters, you know, every, every class I tell this, you know, y'all have any friends over there at MBA school, over there in the business school? You know anybody at those? Y'all go to work, go to work for a big company, go out there. In five years, you know what you're gonna call those guys? Boss. And they're the ones that make all the final decisions on all of this stuff 
and they don't have a clue about it. But they're the finance people and they get hired in at the higher levels of management. And unless you're lucky and you get a guy that actually was an engineer that went up through the ranks, they don't have a clue what they're doing. You get out there around corporate world, a lot of, not every company, but a lot of companies make some pretty crazy decisions that is put down upon their engineering people from up above. I do some work for Archer Daniel Midland. Oh my gosh. They have this, this VP leaves, they hire a new VP and oh my God, it's, it's apple cart upset. And I mean, they change people and they change, you know, they take the same job, they shuffle things. Oh, you're not doing that this that now from now on, you're going to do this. And they, it's just, it's crazy, but it, uh, it happens. Okay. Uh, so, uh, probably could burn Coke oven gas. Part of it, you know, steel blast furnaces use Coke. That's coal that's taken and basically cooked in the absence of oxygen so it doesn't really combust. It makes a, uh, some of the volatiles come out of it. The volatiles come out, those gases form what's called Coke oven gas. It's 500, 600 BTUs per standard cubic feet. They could, that could be, I suspect that could be taken. Uh, steel mills will take that gas, blend it sometimes. Blast furnace gas, very low energy, but you know, environmentally it needs to be combusted. So they'll blend that. They'll blend coke oven gas, blast furnace gas, natural gas, make a blended gas that then goes into boilers, could go into chillers like this, I suspect. That sort of thing. Lots of, lots of possibilities out there. Uh, these systems can provide heating and cooling. Okay, you can do heat recovery from this that can provide hot water for space heating. Now it would be, it's interesting if you're gonna, if you're gonna size the system, are you gonna size it on heating and just take what cooling you get? Are you gonna size it on cooling and just take what heating you get? Because would, you can pick one, but you can't pick both of them because the cycle depends on if you pick a cooling capacity, then you get a certain amount of waste heat that you can recover and use. Well, that's fine. If that's more than you need, then you have extra. If that's less than you need, then you have to supplement. But on, the, on a chiller, usually they're sized for the cooling requirement, and then you take whatever heat you can get, and that reduces the amount of heating energy that, that you would have to do. Uh, picture, let's see what we got here. They don't show, they don't show the hot water load on this thing, but anyway. So fuel supplies, kind of like a little boiler. And, uh, you know, we generate the heat. So those pictures are, I think, of limited utility. There's a picture of one. See, we got a little, just a little boiler section right here. That's nice. Nice little flame coming off of that, that puppy. Yep. It's like you made up a little boiler with the chiller. Okay, so let's do some operating cost comparison. Uh, okay, so. So the single stage is 0.24. The capital T is therm. I was looking at this this morning, about half sleepy, and I looked at that and I says, ah, T, what's that T? T, 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 and finally I recognized it. And I went, oh, that's therm. Okay, so it's 0.24 therms to get 12,000 BTUs of cooling, okay? And it's 45 cents a therm, which is, and there's what, 10 therms in a million. And so that's $4.50 a million gas. Now, you can go look at gas prices. 450 is a pretty current gas rate. Back in the day before hydraulic fracturing and directional drilling, any idea what the gas prices were in the US? Say 20 years ago, man, my consulting business was much better in those days. Because I know how to save people money on boiler systems and steam systems. They were paying eight to $14 a million. In France, what's the, what's the cost of gas in France? Euros, any idea? I would say 
Uh, it's probably 10. I, I would guess 10 euros. Check, check, check me on this before next class. So you, you can just giggle. Yeah, I would say it's 10 euros per gigajoule. Because a gigajoule and a million are very close. There's only like 3% difference, I think, between a gigajoule and a million. And so a euro is worth a little bit more than a dollar. I would guess probably $12 US, which is probably going to be, what, $12 US, 10 euros, something like that, roughly. Yeah, something like that. that does, does, does France produce its own gas? Are you guys buying from Mr. Putin? Like a lot of people in Europe. I hope you're not buying from Mr. Putin, but, but you know, all Eastern Europe and all that, they buy most, they buy most of their gas from, from Russia. Natural gas is the, the main cash export from Soviet Union, or not Soviet Union, from Russia these days. Anyway, okay. So how are we doing? We'll finish up this slide and then we'll get out of here. Uh, so the st single stage is 0.24 therms per ton hour. That's our gas price per therm. So it's what, 10.8 cents per ton hour of refrigeration. For 12,000 BTUs of refrigeration, it costs 10.8 cents, okay? For the two stage, it costs 5.6 cents. Ooh, that's better. For the direct fired, it costs 5.2 cents. Check this out. At six, now this is the centrifugal at 0.6 kilowatt hours, or that's kW per ton, or 0.6 kilowatt hours per ton hour, times eight cent power, that's 4.8 cents. Why in the hell are we doing this? <laughs> well, what you're gonna see is these slides do it in order to reduce that big demand charge. They've got some utility rates in here, some old utility rates for Washington, D.C. I was looking at utility rates around here. It's, it may be fairly comparable these days, but anyway, we'll probably just stay with these slides, but I can, I can pass out some rates to you. And so we'll go through that scenario and finish this up. Okay, so be looking for emails from me. I'll be sending you a file uh, and maybe some instructions. Uh, and also we're gonna have that quiz first thing on Tuesday. Okay? Have a great weekend. See you guys. Oh. Whatever.